Yo, yo, what's going on everyone? It's Dr. Jordan Seda coming to you live from New York City. Are you ready to go to health and back? All right, let's get it. What it do, people? I'm back again for another wonderful episode, but this time joined by Mel Irmao in here in New York, my brother, <laughs> Dr. Giuseppe Demera. Did I say that correctly? Demera? Oh, yeah, you said it perfectly. You said yeah, it perfectly. One, yeah, also Rihanna. known as Champu in, some, in the yes, Capoeira yes. world. Uh, but... Uh, Dr. Demeter, what's going on? It's going good. It's going good. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful day outside. Just came from a swim, so I'm a little chlorine out. <laughs> but other than that, it's doing well. Yeah, he's. Um, I I want to call you Shampoo, but I'll, I'll call you Dr. Dr. Demeter. No, but... call me Shampoo. It's a lot easier for people. Uh, yeah, 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 like, yeah. What, what the heck is it, Giuseppe? <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, Shampoo, you're like one of the only people in the world that would wake up super early on a Sunday to get a swim in and then hop on a podcast with me. So I really appreciate that. Uh, but, you know, I know you. I think most of the couple at a world here, especially in New York, know, is familiar with you and maybe some physical therapists. But for listeners outside of the New York City area, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got here. Yeah, so, um, well, there's, uh, I'll tell you the physical therapy background and then a little bit of the Capoeira background and what I'm doing now. So uh, for in terms of physical therapy, I actually graduated from LIU in 2019, so about three years ago. Um, congratulations to new graduates. Uh, it's a great time. Um, right now I'm focusing on uh, musculoskeletal condition, so I'm working in an outpatient clinic. Um, I finished uh, taking my orthopedic specialization exam, which hopefully I get the results uh, next month and hopefully I pass. But uh, a lot of the patients that I uh, tend to gravitate towards are uh, runners, martial artists, weightlifters. Um, and I've taken a, a little bit more interest in triathletes recently, um, which has been very fascinating because it's a very different world when it comes to like endurance sports. Um, but I've been kind of in that world for a while now. So I've been treating runners since I actually started working as an outpatient clinic, uh, therapist. I, my martial art background actually came from Capoeira, same as uh, Jordan here. So um, i us talk about Capoeira. I started Capoeira when I was in high school and I loved it. Um, of course, the first few, it, uh, the first year of it was hard and I definitely had a love-hate relationship with it. But um, after, uh, doing a bit of it in high school i brought it to my college uh in brooklyn college um and it just it was something that i stuck stuck with for a long period of my life and e even now even though i'm doing a lot of triathlon trainings i still like go back to my capoeira roots at least like once a month uh, or even kind of part of even my exercise program is part of capoeira based exercises or cap capoeira like movements uh one because it's a little bit more different definitely like a big movement variability aspect to my training but it's also like i don't know it feels fun like it's just fun to <laughs> uh do a lot of the capoeira movements as opposed to uh only doing like this repetitive stuff so it's something different yeah i totally feel that um yeah i'm seeing you know, Capoeira in integrated into many sorts of training programs. I mean, whether they categorize it as more animal flow derived from Capoeira, or I've seen some like kai, Capo yoga fusion type things. So I think a lot more people are on yeah, board yeah, with this. Yeah, you know, doing it, right? Yeah, I, I've seen I've seen that. Yeah, and um, looks pretty looks pretty cool. But I think a lot more people want movement variability in their lives in general. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that moving forward, which I think is wonderful to challenge the, the brain and our physical capabilities in a broader context than just the, like you said, the traditional, I guess, linear aspect of training. Now, I wanted to focus more on like working with triathletes, working on runners, because I, I, I do not enjoy running at all. I used to go on long jogs because I felt like it was something I should be doing, but in the essence, I... I would much rather do like interval training on a like a sprint type of thing versus like long distance running but I do realize how large of a community the marathon just like not just the marathon community but even like 5k's 10k's um, and then it can go all the way to like triathlons ultras uh, so very very large that population that need help because they are pounding their bodies consistently so while you've been training, because you've been doing it for quite some time now, 
What would you say you've learned from training for triathlons? Um, so this is actually really, really good that you mentioned that. It's, uh, they mentioned about everybody has the sort of different realm where they feel comfortable with. So um, there's people who do 5Ks, people who do 10Ks that are comfortable with that. Uh, people do marathons and they're like, hey, I'm comfortable with marathons. Let's go to ultra marathons because they're crazy and they just want to uh, keep suffering <laughs> more. Um, but likewise, like uh, you even mentioned that like you kind of like the a more interval training side of it. Like um, I think there's a perfect niche for that. And I think everyone should um, implement some sort of cardiovascular exercise um, into a routine. It doesn't need to be these long jogs. It doesn't need to be these long 18 mile runs that some people do just uh even just five minutes 10 minutes of cardio it's actually quite beneficial um but amongst that um so the things that i've actually learned is actually that uh there's like three big things i'm kind of like wanted to highlight is uh health and one health fitness and health the same thing um and that's one of the more interesting things because i think when people see someone who's fit they must think that uh, either in the, like, they look good sense, like they have the six pack, they have those big chest, the big arms. Um, it doesn't really necessarily mean that they're healthy. Likewise, someone who is like doing these ultra marathons, these uh, like crazy intense, uh, intense distance races, or even fast 5Ks, um, just because they're in a performance sense, like fit and uh, fit, I'll use the words here, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're healthy. Um, so a lot of the people's practices, especially in the endurance side, um, are actually quite detrimental to some extent. Um, they're not eating the right nutrition. Um, they're not timing their nutrition well. They're probably like, uh, if to some extent, uh, going to extreme diets in order to hit a certain weight so then they can run a little bit faster. Um, th their training workloads are insane sometimes. Um, there's one guy who I've, uh, like met who literally does every single training uh like run is seven minute miles so uh easy his easy runs is seven minute mile and he does it for like three four or five miles his long runs are seven minute miles and unfortunately um a long repetitive cycle of that i think he actually had uh, a lot of tendonitis uh injuries he had like a big muscle strain that kind of shut him down for two months um so these crazy workloads also often lead to like uh, what we call overtraining um as opposed to like taking a little bit easier and like as you mentioned like have days where you work on intervals to work on that speed work and uh have your some days where you do easier runs um i think people when they think running they think you always have to run the same exact pace honestly like just even doing a grandma jog um for like 10 or 30 20 minutes is actually pretty healthful for you uh, in a performance standpoint. Um, one other aspect that I see like a lot of people tend to do in terms of like for the fitness side of things is that they don't uh, allow the body to really recover. And that's actually where they miss the mark in terms of the health. Um, so they don't really either have the proper macros when they sleep, uh, when it's proper macros in general, um, they don't have the proper sleep cycles, the sleeping like six five hours a, a day and that accumulation doesn't allow the body to actually rest and recover um so this uh that's like one of the biggest things i learned from this endurance sport is like health and fitness are definitely not the same thing um do you have any thoughts on that plenty um <laughs> first of all i like uh i think we're always trying to mitigate negative training effects and I think to your point modifying training intensity and volume is one of the easiest ways that we can because we I think one of the the key points that all I, I'm going to categorize it, us as healers have to appreciate is that we don't have much control over outcomes we don't and yep. a lot of it is like trying to paint a picture for an, provide a roadmap for an individual who's training on how to enhance physiological preparedness and performance while decreasing the negative effects of training, which are soreness and fatigue, among other things. So to your point, 
Addressing sleep is very important. We know that getting less than seven hours of sleep for two weeks increases injury risk for, I think it's like 1.7 times greater if you, if you have chronic lack of sleep in terms of getting hurt, so that's number one. Number two, I think when you talked about timing and macros, for this population, it's incredibly important, especially as you get closer to race time. Um, and I know that you work with uh, Dr. Lauren Antonucci, and I, I know oh, she's Lauren. She's amazing. Um, and she is the epitome of someone who eats and lives triathlon training. Uh, oh my God, and, she's uh, a beast, a beast. So yeah, so I'm um, shout out Nutrition Energy, definitely a great resource for for eating for performance, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think. And I uh, yeah, go shout out to her too because uh, her book. This is mm. so darn good. Mm. Uh, and it, it's amazing because um, I didn't think of Masters Athletes mm -hmm. um, as being above 35. And I was like, oh boy, I have, <laughs> I'm starting to hit that mark right now. But this is an amazing resource for anyone who's looking into uh, some more in the nutritional side of um, of uh, endurance sports and is hitting above their age of 35. It's amazing. Um, Dr. Lauren Tanushi did an amazing job with this. I'm oh, sorry, uh, Lauren. No, yeah, I, and I, it's I, like, and going back to your point, it's like you have the general runner, like the recreational runner, and then you subcategorize those people into marathons, ultras, triathletes, and as you, I mean, in physical therapy and other businesses, as we have a niche, you kind of have a niche as an athlete. And as you niche down and have larger performance aspirations and you want to be competitive, the timing and the amount of calories, macro distribution matters so much more in terms yes. of mitigating, again, those, in, I, I think I'm using, I should be in finance or something, risk management with using mitigation. <laughs> but, but I think that's what it is. Risk management it consultant. <laughs> yeah, so, hey, you never know in the future, I, I could uh, do that for people, but I Thank think you. I get questions often about nutrition for performance and I think speaking specifically for this because normally if I have a, a lay person who just wants to be quote unquote healthier, I wouldn't focus so much on the timing and all. It, it can be very overwhelming yeah. for someone to macro track, very calorie so. track versus like making smaller scale changes like sub your liquids and think about like consuming more water or or seltzers or I mean there are even some new some dietitians that would say a diet soda is a good start relative to a regular soda so making small changes like that and then starting to stack on but for this population absolutely timing is everything yeah so, yeah especially yeah, since I think the athletes tend to um, so there's one athlete in particular um, who she essentially uh, is very selective on her food um and it's gotten to the point when it's a little hard for her to actually properly recover because she's um so into like okay i need to have this one thing as my recovery but she would wait literally hours to have that one thing when in fact she would have been fine with just having a piece of bagel would have been fine with just having something in her body to help her recover um and i think that's when sometimes uh even with these this population like timing is everything and i think sometimes because they're so type a they tend to overcomplicate things more <laughs> so sometimes even the simple thing of just like hey after your long run eat something anything take something in <laughs> that's much better than waiting for hours for this one particular thing that you think is going to help you it, if anything waiting that long period of time is more detrimental yeah and um, i know there's such a focus on like like supplementation and feeding, like pre-workout, post-workout. Uh, do you have any like suggestions for people from your experience, like maybe a sample of like pre-training, post-training, like how much they should eat, what type of foods or macros they should eat? Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And it depends on the uh, event that you're training for. So let's say if it's a, uh, I'll say this a little bit more recent. Let's say, let's say it's a 5K. Uh, a 5K, you could be a little bit liberal with this. Um, and it's a distance that a lot of tradition, people traditionally go for. Um, so having a meal, and this could be like a 
piece of banana bread um, two or three hours before your race or two or three hours before that event or two or three hours before you run um, will actually be pretty beneficial. Um, and you want to focus on more of the carb side. Having a little bit of protein does help um, if you decide to do so. Um, so that's uh, for like, a, say a 5K. Um, let's say if you're going for a long distance, say a half marathon. Uh, that's when you have to do a little bit more pre-planning. Um, so you might want to eat something out a little bit earlier. So maybe two hours before just something you have that light banana or that light bread, but beforehand have a little bit more food prior, like the night before, um, not, not necessarily carb loading, but just a little bit more, a little extra compared to what you're used to. Um, and the longer distance events, the more, uh, carbohydrates that you want to actually, uh, implement more into the diet. Um, but this is a more of like a pre-workout uh, sort of thing. Um, during, depending on the events, if it's a longer duration, I actually do recommend taking some sort of gels or some sort of nutrition, um, depending on what kind of race you're going for. Um, I think uh, a lot of people tend to under, uh, especially in the marathon or even um, let's say sprints, uh, um, sprint triathlons, distances um they tend to forget that it does it is actually a little bit helpful to have some sort of food so even a gel um one of those things that you just like like uh like this is essentially a syrup that you just suck in um or even just like a quick carbohydrate would be helpful just to maintain that sort of aerobic capacity um now for um longer distances events you need to get used to eating those things during your training um, so, uh, I would probably recommend just having a bar, um, or even just more of those gels. So the longer distance, the distance is the more you need to eat during the event. Um, I don't remember the exact, uh, carbohydrate amount, um, on top of my head. Um, I might just send it over to you and hopefully you could put it down on the bottom so you can check that out. Um, the, uh, Lauren, I think she has a fantastic source for that. Um, but more importantly, I think this is the most important one is the post recovery, the post uh, workout nutrition. And that's when I actually recommend like a three to one carb to protein, uh, ratio as a pre, as a post workout. Um, the reason why is because you actually want to replenish all the carbs that you lost during the event. Um, and that's a huge, uh, like you have had to replenish all the glycogen storage, all the glycogen storage from your muscles, your liver, um, replenish all that because you essentially may have done a long distance event or you may have just done a long distance endurance uh, uh, training session. Um, so three to one would be fantastic. Um, I know in, uh, research actually recommends for, for uh, endurance athletes to have about 1.2 to 1.5 uh, grams of, of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, I think that's a fine recommendation. I tend to go to the more protein side of things. Uh, I mean, it's cause I had like this sort of, a, excuse me. Um, I had this sort of, uh, like strike training background. I tend to go for more protein. I recommend more protein for my athletes. Um, the reason why is because one, a lot of, uh, Americans don't actually get the adequate protein intake. And when you actually talk to these endurance athletes, uh, they don't really take in that much protein. And what they believe is protein is actually more than protein itself. So I tend to skew more into the heavier side. And uh, I know a lot of people, or I've had had these conversations where people would think, oh, that's so much protein. Like, is my body ever going to digest all this protein? And to that point, I say, yeah, your body's not going to digest all that protein. I would rather you have more than less. And a lot more research is actually saying that having more protein is actually not toxic to the body at all. It's that's really like, if you have more protein than your body needs, it's fine. They'll just break it down. Um, so I tend to go lean more to the uh, 1.5 to 1.8 uh, grams of protein per kilogram body weight. Um, hopefully that answers. <laughs> I know it's a long, long list of stuff there, but. Yeah, I mean, but this is such a uh, broad topic, and if it just like many things in life, if there were finite rules for eating, then everybody would be would be adopting them. And I think one of the That's challenges true. to carbohydrate consumption is that they're usually criticized as a negative 
you know, for fit for physique, certainly, even though it couldn't be more far fetched. And, you know, it's funny, I'm actually going to be dropping a resource later on. Uh, and I do talk about nutrition to a degree, but I and my my nutrition background isn't nearly and it should not be near the level of uh, Dr. Lauren, but I, I use a Renaissance periodizations sort of model. They're a great group. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, basically there there is no substitute for quick energy storage other than carbohydrates. Like if I need energy right now, it's my carbohydrates. If I don't have that glycogen immediately ready to go for a high intensity sport, Think about going into a capoeira hora. Like if I'm running on fats, it's not gonna kick in until maybe like a minute, maybe into. Otherwise, like my body's gonna be breaking down protein tissue, fat tissue in order to provide energy, which is gonna lead to detrimental effects. And I think people underestimate the the benefit of having muscle and its role in our bodies regulation of our metabolism and just having centers to generate force like having more muscle allows you to have more motor units to have stronger muscle contractions so exactly from a uh, a performance perspective i'm not saying that mar marathon runners should be jacked i don't think that's the way to go especially because the, the protein needs i don't think are that significant I mean, they certainly are, but not to the degree of what, how many carbs they might need. But I guess yeah. in that post-workout phase, the body is more, it's, it's like looking for that immediate replenishment. So you have a window of opportunity to repair faster because you're, it's more sensitive. Like the, if you think about, I don't want to say homeostasis because it might be a word people don't understand, but... It's definitely shifting to like danger. I just used all of my blood sugar. Like, please give me something. Yeah, no, if, I completely yeah, agree. And that's yeah, why, yeah. like, I, I definitely recommend that three to one uh, mix because it replenishes that glycogen storage, but it also um, essentially decreases the chances of going catabolic, which um, oh, uh, some people in the like weightlifting world don't know what that is. Some people maybe not not be familiar with that word is, but essentially like the breaking down of more than muscle tissue and i think a lot of endurance ass don't really think about that cal catabolic state or that sort of like muscle uh eating uh phenomenon when they go for their training but it's true if you don't have the adequate uh storage of carbs that's going to happen your body has to as uh jordan said before find homeostasis and try to make sure like hey we have enough energy to do our daily functions uh this is why a lot of athletes after like a marathon session or after an intense session um the next day they feel like pure uh i'm gonna do, do a mind if i curse here no it's encouraged yeah they feel like complete shit <laughs> like um like after like these long like uh sort of uh training sessions because they haven't had that adequate uh carbohydrate of recovery um yeah it's co completely completely worthy there yeah and i think i think a point worth making is that if there's a choice between like if you miss that window of opportunity after run after training or a competition like, I don't know what the window is, maybe give or take like up to two hours, perhaps. I mm -hmm. mean, some studies, maybe 30 minutes is usually the the starting point. But I think mm -hmm. as I would rather get the full macro replenishment. Like if you had a choice between like, oh, I missed my window. What's the point? I'm not going to eat anything now versus like you might as well eat. If you can eat enough later to make up for that, it's better than not doing it because you missed the window. Yeah, exactly. I, I think people t uh, think too much of the timing aspect. I think as long as you get something in as soon as possible, um, the better. And even if you could wait, even let's say you miss that, like you said, you miss that opportunity. Um, it, 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 I think uh, if I remember correctly, this may have been a research, what was it, 2018? I don't remember the, who wrote it, but um, they essentially said that nutrient timing yeah 30 minutes is like ideal but it actually goes even past maybe two three hours like you mentioned before um so with endurance runners too it's very similar 
the bigger difference is that you might want to uh, just get more car uh, carbohydrates earlier. Um, that's really the only difference or the yeah, biggest difference. Absolutely. And I think timing is incredibly important, but I think if there's a hierarchy of importance for nutrition and yeah. I'm going again, I'm going based off of the Renaissance periodization model. Hopefully I remember it correctly. Calories first, macronutrients. Yeah. Then you start getting into the timing and composition of foods, so like simple versus complex carbs and things of that nature, like LDL versus HDL sort of lipids, you know. Uh, but I think those are like the elite level modifications that need to be made versus I think 80% of your training benefits could just be from addressing calories and macros. Yes, I completely agree with that. Completely agree with that. So sometimes I think that's going to yeah. overcomplicate things. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like they go Actually, down this rabbit time. hole. It's like I'm not perfect, and now you have all this anxiety about what you're eating. And I think, yeah. like, oh it's my hard. god, I didn't get my Martin gels. I'm so screwed. Yeah, and I think what what I like so much about Dr. Lauren, Dr. Lauren, you weren't supposed to be part of this, but I'm glad that you are. Um, <laughs> she allows herself to also enjoy food. And I think yes. sometimes maybe you feel like you can't enjoy food because you have to restrict your diet so much. But she, you know, finding creative ways to make food tasty, and maybe even loosening the belt a little bit sometimes to enjoy, you know, some ice cream or something. It's still like not detrimental. It's yeah, like it's if very it, true. Yeah, you know, it is like that. If it fits your macros thing, you can go down that road. But ultimately, if like if you fall off, and especially if it's not like. A week before your training like your competition i would say go for it yeah no i, I it's funny because uh i was talking to a friend about this earlier this week and they're like oh you must be eating so healthy it's like no my friends are and this is today my friends are throwing like a baking party day and they're just gonna have a whole bunch of ice cream sweets all this stuff I'm like oh i'm excited i'm totally gonna like dig in on that granted i also am gonna did a pretty long swim workout so I earned that sort of bake-off session. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what people tend to like forget. Like, yeah, in order to like enjoy these foods and enjoy what you like, there's also like the other payoff, which is we need to also be physically active to help it, ourselves enjoy that even more so. And if anything, it just drives that furnace even more. So I am starving. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be so hungry at uh, heading into this bake off. It should be fantastic. Yeah, we're not gonna tell everyone where the bake off is. Otherwise, I think your friend's gonna host like a hundred people ready to eat baked goods. <laughs> All right, so we talked. So we talked a lot about the nutrition, but you know, as a physical therapist, we induce physical load and introduce that into people's routines. So speaking specifically about endurance-based athletes like how do you approach giving them and modifying physical load to make them more resilient performers yeah no i uh that's actually the the big thing i really focus on quite a bit so um it really depends on like of course what are the constituents of the movement so what does that uh thing require of them so let's start with runners because that's a very easy and straightforward one um a 5k distance runner is gonna go for more of that intense high velocity speed work uh, compared to my marathoner. The marathoner has to also do quite a bit of speed work, um, but they are gonna spend a lot more time on their feet, essentially. So um, one of the things that like I tried to look for is when, what is the difference between their structural requirements and their metabolic requirements. Um, and I'm going to essentially break down what that is. We'll start with the metabolic one, since that's the easy one to understand. Um, they're both pretty easy to understand, but uh, the metabolic one is essentially like cardiovascularly. Can your body uh, withstand these loads? Are you able to uh, sustain this, uh, let's say, 150, 160 beats per minute for a long period of time if you're a marathon runner? Um, can you withstand uh, 170 or 180 beats per minute for a long period of time for a 5K? Um, can your body uh, absorb nutrients during this time? Can your stomach uh, have some of those gels and be adequately take that nutrient in? Is it used to taking in nutrients? Is your body able to take in um, whatever uh, carbohydrates or the sports drink you have in order to keep this 
going. Um, so that's a metabolic requirement. Essentially, like how long can your body um, essentially go? The structural requirements is essentially is your uh, musculoskeletal system able to withstand these loads? Um, is your musculoskeletal system allowed, uh, able to have that elastic recoil that's required when you actually go running? So um, essentially, and I might get into somewhat scientific, I'll try to uh, make it a little bit more uh, layman soon, but um, when you actually run, there's uh, quite a bit of tissue deformation. Um, and we want to be able to like make sure our body is able to be resilient enough, like you said, to go through those different phases. So essentially, when the muscle shortens and uh, quickly comes back up, you're essentially doing a polymetric, essentially inducing this quite a light, high load in that long period of time. So um, this is why, like with a lot of my runners, as much as I'm doing strength training work for them as a solid base, I'm also introducing them to some polymetric loading. So I'm adding some pogos, some single legged pogos. Um, I'm, if their person, if the person is not able to, well, of course, like I mentioned before, we need to have a, a, a strength base. Um, if a person not able to do about thirty to thirty five calf raises on one leg, and they're struggling doing like they're, they're struggling at ten that's going to be hard on running. That's going to be hard on their calf musculature. Um, so it'd be hard on the uh, bony structures because they have to withstand all those, that load. Um, I was reading, what was it, like two months ago that um, one of the highest factors for having a stress fracture is actually uh, calf strength and calf uh, sort of uh, circumference, um, which I, I, I was like, oh, wow, that that that's fascinating. That makes sense. But when you actually look at some the, some of these athletes, if they don't have that strong calf musculature, they're kind of screwed. Um, so this is like I put a huge emphasis on that. Of course, there's everything going up the chain too. Like are the quadriceps muscles strong enough to actually withstand these higher loads and higher impacts? Um, it, are they able to get down into like a solid uh, single leg squat? Are they able to go through the whole, like, as I mentioned, the pogo, it's very calf focused, or to uh, do a box jump. And if they're able to do a, a land, do a drop jump and they're able to have that elastic recoil that's in, integrating their quadriceps strength, that glute strength. Um, so it's a lot of, uh, essentially, when it comes to the structural aspect, it really depends on the sport is. Um, obviously someone who's doing a 5k is going to be a little bit more of elastic recoil. They have to do a lot, put this a lot more power, um, as opposed to someone who's a marathon training, they had to work on sustained, uh, polymetrics essentially. Um, so it's, uh, depending on which boat you go towards. Um, but essentially one of the biggest things as I alluded to was I do a lot of strength training work. Uh, building up the that muscle, the musculature, work on that tissue elasticity. We're using polymetrics, um, working on uh, some neuromuscular control. Um, if the person ever needs it, um, that's kind of like lower on my list, um, just a little bit because uh, people tend to over-index how uh, they look running as opposed to um, how uh, just to run itself. Um, it's really interesting because like if you ever uh, this might get into the more endurance side of things um, if you ever see the two people who run um, who ran the Ironman uh, um, excuse me Ironman uh, World Championships uh, this is two weeks ago last week that was last week sorry um, one of the competitors the, who won, the dude who won second place Lionel Sanders you look at his running form and everyone said his running form looks like complete crap it looks like he's hobbling, looks like he's injured, but he's actually like running the, like a uh, half marathon. He's running a marathon in a two hour pace. So sometimes it's not even about the aesthetics or how it looks. It's just a matter of like, can your body take that load? Um, and that's where you want to focus on. When, that's like the biggest things I want to focus on is your body can take that load. Yeah, I think you hit a, an amazing point there where some sometimes elite performers ha have what you would consider like suboptimal body biomechanics. So it doesn't look like they should be efficient, but if they grow to be efficient and resilient in those positions and of generating force, I think people who have perfect mechanics who are not even close to being competitive would, gr would gladly switch places and compromise the perfect form to have better performance. Very true.
Very true. So it's like, yeah, all the, all the principles of being perfect and aligned, I mean, I think in life in general, when you try to adopt this like one size fits all approach to performance, it's, it's terrible. I mean, even in, yeah, you're not going to, you're, you're, you're essentially hitting your head on a wall. Yeah. And I, I don't, don't think it's, uh, yeah, yeah, go sorry. For it. Uh, no, 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 no. I was no. going to say it's also detrimental too, because um, I've had patients who essentially said either they saw another physical therapist or if they had to say like, my running looks like crap. Why does it look bad? I'm like, hey, like you're still running this fast 5K. You're still running this like fast things. You're getting the results. It's just a matter of like, if you care so much of like how it looks versus like with the results you get, that's, there's, there's a misalignment issue there. And it's not even a misalignment of like your body's misaligned. Cause I, believe in that nonsense <laughs> um I, I think it's more of a um your goals are misaligned <laughs> if you want to like get this pr and you want to get this like sort of uh how would i say um goal set do you want to focus on that yeah i think you have the right approach uh, just and it, just from my perspective of how you approach runners uh, building up a formula, formidable work capacity through resistance training, but also I think a lot of runners are misguided when they don't do plyometrics, when they do, or if they do plyometrics and there might be too many contacts too soon in their rehab where you don't want to just go back and doing like a bunch of double unders or maybe a hundred contacts on the first visit after not having done plyo. So a lot of it is like trying to be strategic about when you introduce certain types of stress because plyometrics are fairly taxing on the system. I yeah. think something even like soleus strengthening might be something an endurance athlete might need because oh, that's yeah. the that's For the powerhouse sure. of sure. the calf when I don't know why some people are only focusing on gastroc and it's no it's some yeah, things you're, some you're, things you're, honestly that I service. see I'm just like I I, I kind of just like sit there and I want to like but again, this is me not knowing everything, certainly not about runners, but I know some yeah. shit. And yeah, I know no, that. No, no. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. Cause, uh, we were, I was talking to this with another clinician, like, um, the soleus is literally the strongest muscle you need during these crazy long runs. It's that that's a muscle that's going to be taking in all that load. That's your mm -hmm. endurance calf muscle. So if you're not doing any bent knee calf raises, you're doing yourself a disservice by like not uh, adding that into your program. Um, what was it? I think it was uh, a study three years ago that said um, after I, I might be wrong with this, um, so don't quote me on this. Um, after 30 minutes of running, your soleus muscle is the one that kicks in the most. So, yeah, I'm not know, surprised. The, the endurance on that muscle is pivotal. Yeah, but you know, I think it's great that we have people like you out there working with this population of athletes, because you know, I think everyone is gonna eventually get a musculoskeletal injury if they do some form of training. Uh, but I always say it's better than diabetes. To get a musculoskeletal injury, uh, so this is very true. So, um, but we need we need people like you to guide us. And if people wanted to find out more about resistance training for triathletes, marathon runners, nutrition, and they wanted to talk to you, where would be the best place for them to reach you at? Uh, yeah, so you could actually reach out to me on my uh, Instagram page. It's uh, Doctor G D E N E R A. My last. <laughs> uh on, and on instagram uh, that's probably the best way you could contact me um i think it's like one of the easiest ways you could just see my content and then uh send me a dm if you like if you just want to chat yeah and you're you're in midtown manhattan now correct that's where you treat yes right now i'm working at synergy physical therapy which is okay it was a fun clinic yeah yeah it seems like you like it there and i've seen uh, the quality of videos on on social media for sure from that place so definitely a place I would feel comfortable referring people if I know that they're in the, the Midtown area, especially if they're doing runs in Central Park. It's like literally go for your run and then go right to your clinic <laughs> if they want. But now, uh, it's you know, if people don't know how I became acquainted with you in the first place, it is through Capoeira. 
and I want to talk very briefly about Capoeira before we sign off because I know a lot of hey, people. You can talk about point, Capoeira all day. <laughs> I know, but some people might have already signed off, and I want to make sure that we get in. But um, so you went from being a Capoeirista to a triathlon runner, but Capoeira is always going to be there. It is part of you at this point. So tell me, I guess, a little bit about how Capoeira is aiding you in your journey now, both as a provider, as a person, and in your marathon training. Yeah, like Capoeira, uh, I think I mentioned before, like Capoeira was a huge part of my life and still is. Like uh, every single night, I'm just like always looking at Capoeira videos and still looking into songs. Um, and I'm still in contact with the group that I train with, which is amazing. Um, like this is an amazing network. And uh, there's like so many things I learned. Um, I think one of the bigger ones that I find that's more most interesting is adaptability. Um, I think um, being in the Holda, Holda and uh, going with someone you're not familiar with so uh, I, I say this as a personal experience when I was uh, uh, training with uh, Jordan here uh, and going to some holders. Sometimes you don't know what you're gonna <laughs> walk into. Sometimes it's gonna be like, oh, it's such a nice day outside. I just wanna go play Capoeira and this is gonna be fantastic. And you're flowing out, you're, you're doing really well. You and the person that you're having a uh, Capoeira like conversation of it or geologo a conversation, it's, it's flowing really well someone buys in in the game and that person looks angry and upset his girlfriend broke up with him he doesn't like your face <laughs> and then you know the the shit the, the vibe just changes entirely so um that is when i've learned through capoeira like it, the points of just being adaptable to like not only like the environment yourself itself but even who you come in contact with everyone is in this world is very different so um being able to kind of read the room and see what goes on is like such a, an amazing thing that got where it's taught me and it wasn't even something that was like um uh, essentially like this is what life is it's more of like you learn through it from the scapoid experience i mean yeah that's certainly i mean you're certainly more experienced in capoeira than i am and uh but even in my relatively short period of time of being a capoeirista, I've gathered that there is really only one way and it's to go right into the quote unquote fire. And uh, yeah, you, know, you might be in a situation- That's the only way that, to learn. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you never learn in your comfort zone. Uh, so you always have to, and you don't want to necessarily put yourself in a dangerous situation, but there will be times again when, you know, maybe, you know, you have a visitor coming or a group of visitors and they have certain intentions that you may or may not be aware of or maybe they just want to have a, a good game like you were saying you never know because at the end of the day in Capoeira I feel like no matter what happens in the Holda outside of the Holda it's still relatively amicable for the most yeah. part where you're just kind of like all right like we went we threw it down but now we're going to go drink together afterwards and celebrate oh yeah it's so much fun afterwards so, <laughs> so uh it, it, it really you almost in the head oh your drink <laughs> pretty much uh but there is there really is no other martial art like it i have a background in taekwondo and judo before capoeira and um, it's certainly just something irreplaceable the energy is palpable and difficult it's really difficult to explain capoeira to people who don't understand so capoeira yeah it is so hard because uh there's so many times uh well this happens a lot when i'm running in a the track there's uh, people playing capoeira and i sometimes actually go play with them and they're like, oh, you're dancing. I'm like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Kind of. And then when they actually see the more like uh, martial arts side of it, they're like, that's what? what? Yeah. What, what was that? It's like, yeah, it's, it's a martial art. We're just, we're just dancing in the end of it. Right. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a very like, uh, it, it's hard to describe it if you're not in it. And even when you're in it, you're not fully, you don't, there, there's so many more intricacies. Yeah, and that's when uh, we have like amazing instructors like Introdogo Gion, amazing, amazing. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, he's not professor. He's professor now, or is he now mestri? Uh, I believe later this year he will become mestri. Oh, para dance, para dance. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. No, he's, a, he's an amazing, amazing uh, mestri. 
Yeah. So, um, like, I learned so much from him. Um, even Ishuto uh, Pashto, uh, like, amazing resource of information. And Absolutely. It's so funny because, like, when you talk to them and you tell them about your experience, like, yeah, that's, that's Capuera. And then when you talk to them, they, when they talk to their mentors, you learn that they don't know everything. So it's very similar to, uh, I, I know this is, like, off podcast. Uh, we talked about this, but, like, um, the importance of mentorship and how, like, um, it's always someone ahead of you, no matter what, and it's always someone that you could always learn from. And like, um, I think like Capoeira has like taught me that immensely. Um, they showed me that with physical therapy, like uh, even Jordan here, seven years of experience, I'm learning from him. Um, he's safely uh, taking the time to like help mentor me as a physical therapist too. So, you know, it, it's amazing. Like I think uh, Capoeira has taught me like the importance of like this mentorship too. Absolutely. It is a, it's definitely a sport where you have to, you give to it, you take from it and you share because yeah. I think if you don't share, it's a sign of insecurity. It's a sign that you want to withhold information from someone for your benefit because you fear that they're going to supersede you. But I want to be playing games with people in the Hoda that will only make me play better games. I don't want to dominate. I want to, take a martello to my face once in a while because then I'm going to learn how to react to that. So same yeah. thing in physical therapy. Like if I'm if I'm not going to teach yeah. you something that's going to enhance your skill set, A, I'm doing a disservice to people and I'm doing a disservice mm-hmm. to the profession and how people perceive it. So it 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 just it's not even a question. Of course I'm going to share. Of course. Yeah, no, no, no. I think it's amazing. And I think that's like one of the biggest things is like you want to share. And that's kind of the biggest thing I've like, uh, there's so many things I love for Cup Puerto, like the adaptability, the sharing the community. But I think like the biggest thing is just like, there's, you're always going to want to give more than you take. Because when you give more, you get back so much more. <laughs> um, Absolutely. So like, I know you mentioned like the matalo to your face, like, I think I, I learned more when I was always in that point of uncomfortable. And then eventually I was like, oh, I'm okay with this. If this is like, okay now, like I'm okay with being slightly uncomfortable. And it's just, yeah, yeah. magical thing. Absolutely. Anyway, um, that's all the time we have today, beautiful people. I again want to thank Giuseppe, AKA Shampoo for his time. Now get out there Pardon and make sure happen. Thank you much. I had to, I had to call out your couple of names too, so. Aye. If we're just throwing out a couple of names. Ciao, James. I love it. Bye bye.